Hey everyone, Eugene here for Epically Geeky Makers. So last week Nintendo announced that they were going to be discontinuing the NES Classic and broke a lot of hearts. Our uh, own Cyrus Martin and uh, Picky Old Gamer even weighed in on it because it was it was a pretty big deal, especially in the gaming community. Um, luckily, I was actually able to get a hold of one. Um, I'm be honest, I was quite lucky to get a hold of this thing. It uh, I had to wait in quite a few lines, but I managed to get my hands on one and uh, my. Five-year-old boys have loved playing it. Going back and playing those old retro games with them has been a lot of fun. And um, unfortunately, the prices have already started. They've always been kind of high because it's been extremely hard to get a hold of, but they're just going to keep going up. And I, I hate the fact that people are not going to be able to experience that retro gaming, probably with their kids, or just going back and reliving their childhood by not being able to get a hold of one of those. So I decided to do something about it. And uh, what I decided to do is to take one of these, a... Raspberry Pi. It's a for if you don't know, it's a very small computer, has several different ports on it, and it uh, runs about thirty or forty dollars. Not really extre uh, extremely expensive, but you can do a lot of really cool stuff with this. Just look it up. Uh, one of the things you can do with it that's really cool is run RetroPie, which is a uh, system that lets you run a bunch of emulators on this, uh, which is basically what the NES Classic is doing. Of course, it's mainly just for or it's just doing you know NES games. This thing can actually run emulators for almost well i say almost anything up to about mm, 32 bit uh, 64 bit games uh we'll get into that a little bit more later uh but yeah you can actually run nintendo sega genesis super nintendo uh game boy i mean there are a lot of things you can run on this thing so what i decided to do is take one of these and try to make it more like one of these uh there are some very basic cases you can get for a retro uh, raspberry pi kind of like this this is the one that I actually bought that I had it running in. Uh, but I wanted the experience more like this thing. Uh, you know, it looks like a regular Nintendo. It's got the, you know, the ports up front here for the controllers. It's got a power button and reset button. And unfortunately, the way the Pi is set up, you have your ports on the back. And then your other ports are on the side. Uh, so... You can get some cases, like the one that I just showed you, and some other cases online uh, that even look like a Super Nintendo, but all the ports are on the side. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make it look like an actual Super Nintendo. So, I made this. This is what I've been working on for the last couple weeks. And over the course of this video, I'm going to show you how to make one step by step. Get ready, get set, let's make an SNES Mini. For this build, you're going to need the following things. The 3D printed bottom, the 3D printed top, the 3D printed start and reset buttons, the 3D printed eject button, the 3D printed USB controller ports. Now the ones pictured here are players 1 and 3 and 2 and 4, but I also created a set so that it's 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 in case you decide you want to change up the way the controllers are set. Momentary push button, 12 volt 5 millimeter LED, any keyboard will work, USB controllers, the Raspberry Pi 3, a 2.5 amp micro USB power supply, a micro SD card with reader, I would suggest 8, 16, or 32 gigabytes, HDMI cable, four one and a half foot USB extension cables, five number four three fourths inch wood screws, a number one screwdriver, 22 gauge wire, soldering iron and solder, wire strippers, optional a 2.54 millimeter pin connector set, optional snips, a file, and needle nose pliers. As I was designing it, I used the basic dimensions for the original Super Nintendo to give me a guideline. I put in a section in the back so that the Raspberry Pi would fit in nicely, you'd be able to get to all the ports. The reason why I created it in uh, different components is because I wanted it to make it easy so that you could paint it if you decide to do that later on, or in my case, so that you could print the individual parts in different colors. The first thing you'll need to do is to download RetroPie. You can get that from retropie.org.uk. Click on download, scroll down to where you can find the different versions of Raspberry Pi. In this case, we're going to be using a Raspberry Pi 3, so click on Raspberry Pi 2-3. The next thing you'll need to do is to download Etcher, and you can get that from etcher.io. Once you have Etcher downloaded, go ahead and install it. Make sure your SD card is in your computer, and then open up Etcher so we can begin to image the disk. 
select the correct image we're going to use. In this case, it's going to be RetroPy-4.2. Choose the correct drive and then click image. Now, this is going to take about three minutes for it to work. First thing it has to do is actually image the disk, and then once it's done, it's going to verify the disk. Overall, this takes about three minutes, but I sped this up greatly, so we didn't have to set all the way through that. Then it's done. Next, we need to get the Pi set up so that we can get it going for the rest of the process, so we can send commands to it. Go ahead and insert the micro SD card, a USB controller, the HDMI cable, and lastly, plug in the USB power cord. The first time you boot up the Pi, it's going to go through a pretty lengthy setup process. After it does that, it'll eventually come up to Emulation Station, and now you can start to set up your controller. Doesn't really matter what controller you have plugged in, in this case I have just that Super Nintendo style controller, so I've only got limited buttons on it. Once you get down to the buttons that you don't have or may not have on your controller, just hold down any button and it'll let you bypass it until you get to the rest of the screens. This should take us to the RetroPie screen. If you haven't already, go ahead and plug into Ethernet. If you're not going to do that, it's time to set it up on Wi-Fi. Go into Configuration, scroll down to Wi-Fi, click on Connect to Wi-Fi Network, find your Wi-Fi network, enter your password, and then click OK. It may take a second for it to connect, but then it should be good to go. Now we need to set up RetroPie Manager. To do that, we're going to scroll down to RetroPie Setup. The first time you do this, it may take a few moments, so just give it a second. Then we're going to click OK and go down to Manage Packages. After that, we go down to Manage Experimental Packages. Scroll all the way down, almost to the very bottom, second one from the bottom, and choose RetroPie Manager. This is going to take a little while to install, so just sit back and enjoy it. Once that's done, we're going to go down to Configuration Options and enable RetroPie Manager on boot. Go ahead and click OK. Then we're going to go ahead and start the RetroPie Manager now. Now we need to go back over to our computer and do a few things, but first we need to grab our IP address. On the main configuration screen, go down to Show IP. When the window pops up, your IP address should be listed up top. Make sure you write that down. Now we're going to enable SSH on the Pi. Go to Rasp Config. You will need a keyboard for this. The controller somewhat works. Sometimes the buttons aren't always mapped to the same place. It's just easier with a keyboard. Go down to Interfacing Options. Go to SSH. Click Yes, hit Tab, then Exit. Now we're going to enable the Pi so that the on-off button will work. Normally that doesn't happen, so we have to do a little coding. Don't worry about it, I'll hold your hand. The first thing we need to do is download RetroPie on-off v1. I'll have a link for that down in the description. On a Mac, you can open it up in Notepad. If you're on Windows, you might want to download and install Notepad++. Using the normal notepad on Windows sometimes causes issues. Also, if you're on Windows, you need to download and install PuTTY. If you're on a Mac, you can just use Terminal. If you're in PuTTY, you need to input the IP address, Pi for the username, Raspberry for the password, and port 22. On the Mac, we're going to type in ssh space pi at and the IP address. Now we're going to type yes. Then we type our password. The rest of this process is as easy as copy and pasting from one window to another. The first thing we're going to do is to grab line one, copy it, move back over to our window, hit paste, then hit enter. When the command finishes running, you're going to run back over to our text document, grab line number two, copy it. Back to our document, paste, hit enter, and we're pretty much just going to keep doing that all the way down until we get to the point where we create a new document. At this point, we're just going to copy a larger section of information from the text file. So we're just going to grab it, and once again, we copy it, move over to the other window, paste, 
Now we hit Control X and then Y to save it. Hit Enter and it'll kick you back out of your new document. We're going to skip the reboot step and move down to the next line. So we just copy, move back over to our window, paste, hit Enter, and it's going to open up another document for us. Now we're going to grab this other line of code. We're going to move back over to our window and we're going to use our keyboard to move down to below this line, below the FI, and then we just paste it in. We hit Control X, then Y, then Enter, and now we can go in, grab our reboot command, copy, paste it in, hit Enter, and reboot our Pi. Now we can turn on our power LED. So, go back into configuration, Go down to Rasp Config. You will need the keyboard again for this. Now, depending on your version of RetroPie, this is in a different location. I'm running 4.2.2, so it's under Interfacing Options. Go down to Enable Serial. Click Yes. Hit OK. Tab. OK. Now we can hit Start on our controller, reset our Pi, and the LED and on-off switch should work on our system. Now we need to make some wires. Cut four wires about six inches in length. Strip the protective coat back on each of the ends. If you have the ability to add female pin plugs, go ahead and do so. If not, we'll just have to solder it on later. You're going to connect two wires in a double pin connector and the other ends to the push button. I didn't have the correct connectors, so I just had to solder them onto the button. Still worked fine. Now connect the other wires to the other double pin connector and the other ends of those wires to single pin connectors. Insert the ends of the LED into the double pin connector. Make sure to take note which wires connect to the positive or longer leg of the LED. Now plug the button onto pins 5 and 6 on the Raspberry Pi and plug the positive LED wire onto pin 8 and the other wire onto pin 39. You should now be able to push your on off button and watch the LED come on along with the Raspberry Pi. Wait a few moments before you try hitting the button again to try turning it off. Now we can move on to actually uh, putting together our case. The first thing you may have to do is remove some of the uh, stringiness that happens on an overhang when you do a 3D print. It just tends to happen, it's not a big deal. Just take a pair of needle nose pliers and get rid of it. Next let's glue in our controller port holders. Make sure that you put them in the right place, uh, depending on which one you decide to go with, one and two, or one and three, and then two and four, or three and four. Before you insert the Raspberry Pi, make sure you take out the SD card, because otherwise it will keep it from going in. The other thing is, is this is extremely tight. Uh, your Raspberry Pi may fit in there just fine. Mine would not go in there, so I had to take out one of the little tabs that was on there. Just take a screwdriver there and, and force it out. Um, now we can go ahead and start running our USB cables. They basically run down and around and underneath where the uh, button is going to go. Just wrap them back around and go ahead and do all four of them. I would start with the bottom ones first. Just remember that those are controllers two and four. Uh, there's a diagram on the screen now that shows you how they are numbered. If you're not 100% sure which one is which, you might want to hold off on gluing them in. But if you're pretty certain like I was, you can go ahead and glue them in and uh, be ready to go. Next, we'll put in our on-off button. Just push it down into the hole and snake the wire through. Plug it back into the Raspberry Pi. Then we'll put in our LED. Make sure to account for the positive wire going into the correct pin and the uh, ground wire going into the ground. At this point, I'd go ahead and plug in the power for the uh, Raspberry Pi, make sure that it works, make sure your power LED comes on like it's supposed to. Uh, once you've made sure that that happens, go ahead and put a little glue on the outside edge, and you should be able to slide it into the proper hole on the front of the case. Let's move on to the top of the case now. The eject button can be pushed into place, just uh, snap it in, make sure the little tabs fit in where they're supposed to. The uh, start and select buttons can actually just fit on there by kind of clipping them on. You can go back and glue them later if you decide to. I would suggest taking the top back off and go ahead and kind of pre-screw the uh, screws in. Uh, they're a little difficult. Uh, you may have to give them a little bit of force and uh, just kind of get them so that they're barely poking up through the top on the bottom part of the case. Uh, at that point, you can put the top back on 
and uh, you can probably just hold it with your hand if you've got clamps you might want to use that but then uh, just continue to screw them in until they pretty much won't go any further uh, I chose three quarter inch screws so that uh, they wouldn't go too far and uh, should hold it on nicely with the system build complete go ahead and fire it up get it turned on plugged in and now we can start putting some games on it the easiest way to do that is to just go to your computer open up a web browser and go to http colon slash slash your IP address for your Raspberry Pi colon 8000 that'll allow you to access the manager that we installed previously and will allow you to easily drag and drop games over to the system it will also allow you to check in on your system and see statistics like its speed, how hot it's running, the CPU usage, the RAM usage, the memory usage. All that stuff is easily accessible through the web browser. In order to move ROMs over to your system, you just click on the ROMs tab up at the top. Open up your computer wherever you have your ROMs stored. No, I'm not going to talk about how to get the ROMs, where to get the ROMs, how to back up your computer games for the ROMs. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. But then you just drag them over one at a time or in multiples to the appropriate folder. When you get to Neo Geo, if you are playing Neo Geo games, uh, once again you just drag the ROM over, but you also need to drag over the BIOS for it. You can find that by going to Google and typing in Neo Geo dot zip space BIOS. That's all I'm going to leave at that. Just, just Google it. You should be able to find it. But you're going to drag it over to the Neo Geo ROMs folder as well. We also need to click on the BIOS tab we're going to drag a copy of it over there as well. This was a suggestion by ETA Prime. It worked for me, so I'm passing it on as well. After you get the ROMs on the system, I performed a complete reboot. You can just restart Emulation Station for the new games and systems to show up, but I did a complete reboot. Once there are games for a console, you can actually see the console showing up. So you can see I'm scrolling through here of all the different consoles that I added. Here's the Super Nintendo. The one game that I added is F-Zero. So we're going to go in, just make sure that works. You'll notice this splash screen that comes up, just a very simple box. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. And there it is. Now let's go grab our game art. Hit star on your controller and then go to Scraper. Go down to Scrape Now. If you're doing a large number of games, I suggest turning off user decided conflicts. Otherwise, you're going to have to check almost every single game. Hit start and it should find the game art for most of your games. When it's finished, it will tell you how many games it ended up missing. For example, if we go into the Super Nintendo, we see that it did not find the game art for F-Zero. But if we go into the Atari, it did find the game art for Berserk. Now we're going to go in and change the splash screen from that simple window that came up when we clicked on the game to actually displaying the game art when it loads. So, go into Configuration, RetroPie Setup, Configuration Tools, go down to the Run Command, Launch Menu Art, and now it should be enabled. You can do custom art, but I'm not going to go through that here. Now let's kick back out to our main menu and go check out our artwork. Go find a game that has artwork, in this case Berserk. We go into the game, and there it is. Now let's add a splash screen to the RetroPie when it boots up as well. Go into Configuration, and go down to Splash Screens. Once again, you can upload your own videos and images to use as a splash screen, but I'm going to stick with what's already on the system. Click RetroPie Splash Screens. Of the ones listed, I like Carbon. Hit OK. Then kick back out to the main menu and restart our system. That looks much better. Now let's play around with the theme for the actual system. Go into Configuration, scroll down to ES Themes, you'll be presented with a bunch of themes that you can download. Personally, I like Pixel. Click on it, and after it downloads, go back to your main menu, hit Start on the controller, go down to UI Settings, then go to the theme set and move over till you get to your new theme. Hit back, and there you go. You may have noticed that Genesis and TurboGrafx-16 show up as Mega Drive and PC Engine, as how they're known to the rest of the world. If you're in the US and you want to change that, here's how to do it. If you're on Windows, download WinSCP. If you're on Mac, download and install FileZilla. The links will be in the show notes. 
Download the platforms.cfg file, also in the show notes. Connect using your IP address, username pi, password raspberry, and port 22. You're going to go to the root folder, then options, RetroPie, configs, and all. At this point, drag and drop the file into the system, and then we can move back to the Pi. Go ahead and restart the RetroPie. When it comes back up, go into configuration, RetroPie setup, manage packages, manage main packages, and now we have to update the Genesis and TurboGrafx-16 packages. For the Genesis, we need to update LR Genesis plus GX and LR Pico Drive. For the TurboGrafx-16, we need to update LR Beetle PCE Fast and LR Beetle Super Graphics. Give the system a quick reboot, and once it comes back up, we should have our artwork for the Sega Genesis and for the TurboGrafx-16. Now that we've updated the console names, we need to go back in and update the game art as well. Hit start on the controller. Open the scraper again. And this time, make sure to leave it set to the user decides on conflicts. Choose the correct game art and click save. You may also run into situations where the scraper has picked the wrong title and game art for a file. For example, it chose Sonic and Knuckles when it's actually Sonic 1. You can choose specific games, hit select on the controller, edit the metadata, and choose the correct game. There, that's better. Another issue you may run into is when the scraper cannot find a game at all. For some reason, it cannot find F0. So here's how to go in and add game art yourself. Open up a web browser and look for your missing game art. Once you find one that you like, download it. Now open up FileZilla again. Go ahead and log back in. You're going to go to Option, RetroPie, Configs, All, Emulation Station, Downloaded Images. There will be folders for all of the game art that you've already downloaded. I've noticed that if the art you are trying to use is much bigger than about 100 kilobytes, you may have to resize it. If there's not already a folder for the console, right click and create a directory. In this case, I'm calling it SNES. Drag the artwork into the folder. Leave this window up because you are going to need it in just a moment. Back on the Pi, highlight the game and hit select on the controller. Choose Edit Games Metadata. Using a keyboard, edit the name. Then, edit the image. You're going to have to type in that extremely long path and file name exactly as it's listed. Once you've done that, hit OK, click Save, and you should now have the game art. Make sure do not do this before you update the Turbo Graphics or Sega Genesis, especially if you're planning on doing that. Otherwise, you will have to go back and redo this. Now let's talk a little bit about the controls. Once you're in a game, hitting Select plus X lets you get into the Retro Arc menu. Here you can mess with the shaders and some of the other settings. Select plus B allows you to reset the ROM. Select plus Start gets you back to the main RetroPie menu. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I had a lot of fun doing it. I learned a lot during the process, but man, this was a lot of work as well. Uh, all of the links for all of the files, the tutorials, the materials, everything I used to make this, this awesome little piece of awesomeness is listed down below. Uh, big shout out to ETA Prime on YouTube. His tutorials were awesome for helping me get this project done. I also really need to th uh, send a thank you out to my friends and family. I've been kind of crazy the last two weeks trying to get this thing done. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for supporting me. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and give us a big thumbs up on the video. It really does help out a lot. This is Eugene for Epically Geeky Makers. See you next time.